Uh, the Canada India Network Society is so honored to host you all this morning. Welcome to our conversation on South Asians and COVID-19, mental health and opioids with our panel of experts. I'm Jesse Corlahale, today's moderator. I'm the Strategic Communications Director for Canada India Network Society. And a few of, a few of my other health related hats include board director for a health authority and the founder of Core Collective where I'm working on research titled the brown body experience for South Asian women. Uh, before we get rolling into this morning's program, it is important we as settlers acknowledge with deep humility, respect and gratitude that we are having this dialogue on the ancestral, traditional and unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples and in particular, the Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil for those unfamiliar with Canada India Network Society, I'd like to give you a quick intro to it. CINS, a nonprofit organization, conceptualizes, collaborates, and coordinates between people, organizations, and institutions to improve the health of people of Canada and India. We focus on research, innovation, education, and awareness, and advocacy and previous conference outcomes have led to the creation of the South Asian Health Institute, Safe Advocacy and the Leeds Education Collaboration in India. Today's dialogue is a precursor to the Canada India Network Society Conference, lowering the burden of chronic diseases through integrative thinking and the voices from the trenches that will be happening June 18th to the 20th. I encourage you all to register for that conference to learn more about integrative medicine and South Asian health and the recommendations that come from it. That's this morning's plug right away. <laughs> uh, a few housekeeping uh, items. Today's event is being recorded and will be viewable post conversation. We're also live tweeting this dialogue and our Twitter account is at the CINS. Please follow along in the conversation, retweet, and use hashtags you find in our tweets. Uh, today, we are encouraging comments and questions throughout this dialogue. Gentle reminder to be respectful. This is an opportunity to build community and learn from one another. Let's stay in that frame of mind. That being said, we ask you to write your questions and comments in the chat box. We'll do our best to engage and answer questions. Only speakers will be able to use the mic option for this dialogue today. Okay, I think that's enough for the housekeeping. Uh, introductions for today. Today's guest speakers are wise voices, voices in the trenches of health crises, voices that look at the gaps that exist in health systems, voices that look to what is not working and respond by directly uh, directing back to root causes, systemic presence, presences and are finding solutions. We are moved to bring these voices to you, friends. Our esteemed guests include Dr. Swyman Singh, Dr. Natasha Puri, Dr. Shimmy Kang, and Dr. Arun Garg. I'll ask each of you to introduce yourselves and your work through the lens of South Asian health and your COVID-19 mental health opioid focuses so that it fits the context of this conversation. We'll start with Dr. Swyman Singh. Hey everyone, this is Dr. Swayman Singh. I'm currently at, in Haryana, in India, uh, working at the uh, uh, borders around Delhi, uh, dealing with the COVID situation here. I'll, uh, a little bit of uh, brief, uh, I'm also the founder and president of Five Rivers Heart Association. Uh, I am uh, currently a cardiology fellow in the United States. I'm a board certified internal medicine doctor. Um, and uh, we run an organization called Five Rivers Heart Association, which focuses on basically equality amongst healthcare and education uh, around the world. We have been um, working, we have been registered for the past two years, but unofficially had been working for about the past 10 years. Um, mainly our focus has been uh, in India, uh, trying to uplift education, trying to bring educations to um, uh, places you know, that are kind of like far reached, uh, as well as holding medical camps, um, building libraries. Uh, our future goals include working in Ghana, uh, working in other parts of Africa, alongside working in 
uh, United States, especially areas uh, like Newark, New Jersey, where I was doing my fellowship. Um, we, uh, you know, our focus has been, you know, doing medical camps, uh, bringing doctors to places um, that really, uh, you know, are suffering from things like uh, uncontrolled hypertension, diabetes. Uh, then we have our telemedicine department where we connect people uh, through telemedicine, we connect doctors with, you know, patients. Uh, our futures will include basically setting up telemedicine uh, services uh, and other uh, healthcare facilities in places like India, Africa, uh, you know, where, you know, uh, it's, it seems like, you know, they're suffering from uh, basic healthcare. Uh, currently, I'm working uh, part of the, you know, working in the protest sites in India, serving here for the past six months. Uh, we have also been serving the areas around New Delhi and Haryana. Uh, we, we formed a COVID task force, which has taken care of uh, 250, over 250 patients, uh, providing free medication during COVID times, providing uh, free oxygen, providing basically free health care. Uh, we go uh, into people's homes and see patients, you know, especially those who do not have, uh, who, don't, who, who can't afford either afford health care or who don't have the availability uh, for healthcare. Uh, we have seen uh, over 600,000 patients at the protest sites, whether it's locals, whether it's pro you know, farm farmers or you know, police officers, CRPF uh, people, giving free medications, uh, you know, uh, free testing uh, and all that. Um, so that's what we've been doing. And you know, our future goals will include, again, uh, building schools, building libraries, uh, getting telemedicine involved into healthcare uh, and basically anything else that people might need. Great, thank you so much. Um, Dr. Natasha Puri, I'll ask you to go second. Hi everyone, uh, again, thank you so much for the invitation to be part of the panel today. Um, my name is Natasha Puri, I'm a family physician uh, who practices in British Columbia, trained here, and I've also been trained in the subspecialty of addiction medicine. Um, I was always really fascinated by the neuroscience and sort of the brain chemistry of addiction, but um, the more I started to interface with it in the healthcare system, I realized the really Im important personal work lay in the psycho-spiritual realm of it and really supporting people to find their own recovery and their own healing. Um, I thought that there's, that's kind of something we all need to do. So there's very personal kind of experience in treating addiction. Um, so as I began my career as a family doctor and an addiction medicine specialist here in BC, I was looking for jobs. I came across the Fraser Health Authority where I currently practice. And one of the opportunities that came to me was uh, the medical director said, you know what, there are a lot of folks of South Asian ancestry who uh, are presenting with addiction and mental health illnesses, but they're struggling to really remain engaged in the services. And is there anything you can do about this? So that sort of embarked me on a journey of really trying to understand the multiple health system barriers that exist for folks of South Asian ancestry who struggle with, uh, I think, mental health and addiction. And um, what came out of that journey was the inception of a clinic called the Roshni Clinic, which is unique in that it's situated at the health authority, it's government funded, but it provides culturally tailored and resonant care specifically to folks of South Asian ancestry who are struggling with substance use disorder. So um, this clinic has been in practice for about three to four years now, going through still some growing pains um, as the health authority tries to catch up and understand what the needs are. And um, I, uh, that's sort of where I'm situated right now. So that's sort of where I come from to our conversation today in terms of my experiences and ideas. And I'm really excited to keep learning with everybody here today and look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Shimi Kang. Hello, everyone. I'm very grateful to be here. I am Dr. Shimi Kang. I'm I'm here at my home office uh, in Vancouver, Canada. I'm on my treadmill. I'm trying to be a good role model and keeping myself moving. Uh, so my training is I'm a psychiatrist with training in addiction psychiatry. So uh, and board certified in psychiatry and neurology in the United States and um, here in Canada. And so I am really passionate about this topic. Um, I think that uh, in my 20, over 20 years of working as an addiction psychiatrist, I feel that 
Um, you know, we are obviously in an opioid crisis, we're in a mental health crisis, uh, and we're certainly in a crisis in youth mental health. Uh, so my work has been at BC Children's Hospital. I was the founder of a program called the Provincial Youth Concurrent Disorders Program. That was a program that um, sees young people from a lens of both mental health and addiction as opposed to one or the other. Uh, I created that program uh, 20 years ago and it was a bit of a fight to get um, the program to allow young people up to the age of 24, 25, um, because Children's Hospital had never done that. And it was based on the neurobiology of, of the brain and also, uh, you know, the, the trajectory of addiction, which really begins in adolescence. Um, you know, it's a disease that generally begins there um, and also generally is comorbid with mental health. So you all know that. Um, that's my passion. And then uh, I ended up uh, realizing that a lot of the work that I was doing, and I had a six month wait list or one year wait list, um, really needed to be in the hands of the public. So I began writing and blogging and doing media. Um, and I've written um, several books. One is The Dolphin Parent. One, my latest book is called The Tech Solution, uh, where I go deep into the science of, of technology use and how it impacts our mental health and the addictive potential there as well. Uh, with dopamine and persuasive design. I personally feel this is an unfolding crisis, especially among young people. Uh, in the last 14 months, I've seen so many young people already, um, you know, with anxiety, depression, uh, ADHD, um, and now the perfect storm of the stress of COVID and stress was the number one health epidemic pre-pandemic. Uh, I worked at the World Health Organization in the 1990s and I, in Geneva, Switzerland on that research that declared it. So we were already not in a good place um, and then add that in. And now, uh, you know, I just got a call from a colleague who's a South Asian um, colleague who's been busy in this pandemic as a healthcare practitioner whose son um, discovered women and went online, got heavily addicted to pornography, um, depressed, anxious, suicidal. So this is kind of my practice. My inbox is full. I see it everywhere. Um, I've worked in India and um, I'm very grateful for um, Dr. Swaman there. I've worked in Haryana and in Punjab um, as, as a primary care doctor um, out in the rural areas. And I have a center in Delhi called Dolphin Pod. It is a life skills center for children. Uh, and we are working with some of the most vulnerable children in India, uh, helping them with social, emotional, mental health literacy and trauma resilience. Um, and that's right in the heart of Delhi. And, and I run that program from here as well, here in Canada. So I'm really passionate about the Canadian Indian connection. Uh, I think we have a lot of knowledge to share, a lot of um, um, knowledge exchange to happen in both sides. So grateful to be part of this. And I'll just also say I'm a patient. I have a genetic condition called Irlos Danlos disorder. Uh, I live in chronic pain. I've been prescribed opioids. I, um, I have battled um, daily chronic pain for over five years. I've had two seven day hospitalizations during COVID uh, for ketamine treatment uh, for pain. So I, I would love to also express and share my experiences on the other end of this system. Uh, and of course, I'm South Asian. I'm the youngest of five children, immigrant parents who uh, came to this country from Punjab. So great to be here. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Arun Garg. Well, good morning or good evening. My name is Arun Garg and I'm so grateful and so thankful to be with you. Uh, before I start, I do want to acknowledge um, uh, the work of two Jassies. Uh, you might think that Canada India Network Society is some big organization with a lot of resources, friends, I have a story to share. This is work of passion. And these two young ladies have put this together. So call out to them. Thank you very much uh, for putting this together. Uh, as Jesse said, this is really a um, beginning of uh, our celebration of month of yoga, uh, integrative medicine, integrative thinking. Uh, month of June is International Yoga Month and uh, we are part of it. Uh, this is our fourth uh, Canada India Network initiative. We started, our journey started in 2010. And as already we alluded, uh, uh, the 
South Asian connection between Canada and India is a unique opportunity to build economic ties, to build cultural ties, and to bring countries together. So that was the intent we started, and so happy to share that uh, recommendation we made in 2010 of establishing South Asian Health Institute at Fraser Health because of uh, just the nature of the patients and the population. And COVID has proven that that was a right thing to do. The engagement of the community has been made possible because of that institute, vaccination programs and uh, reaching out cultural sensitivities and the institute has been serving that population very well. So I'm so happy that from a small idea, uh, we established the institute of which I'm the medical director and slowly but surely we're building that capacity and building healthy society. Uh, in case you're wondering, uh, the theme for 2021 is um, lowering the burden of chronic diseases through integrative thinking. You might be wondering how we came to that term. As a practitioner for over 40 years, and most of you know me, I'm a medical biochemist and they don't come any more subspecialist than that, with thinking at the cellular level. But over last 10 years, it was very obvious to me that from cellular level, we need to go to the holistic level. There is a gap in our thinking. So integrative thinking is a way of thinking about holistically about the whole system. And we are applying that integrative thinking to better healthcare. Integrative thinking to think from the cell. We have made so much progress in physical sense of uh, Western medicine, but we have left a gap in thinking about a person. So for last year and a half, we've been working with several people and they will all be speaking at our conference, Voices from the Trenches. They are applying from the cell to the gross level and they will be sharing that experience. So I think today what you're seeing is the start of that integrative thinking. Uh, Jesse already mentioned about South Asian Health Institute. The other thing I'm very happy to share with you is recently launched program in India on integrative leadership. India can have tremendous uh, opportunities in healthcare, and we have launched a web-based program uh, for integrative leadership based on modern leads program, but marrying it with Vedic philosophy of yoga. And yoga is nothing more than a leadership training. So I'm so happy to be part of this distinguished panel. Once again, thank you to my two Jesses who have put this together and uh, we look forward for further discussions. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you. Um... I'm going to start with Dr. Swyman Singh uh, because there is a, a, a electricity outage happening in India. So we wanna ensure that we get a fulsome conversation with him. I do wanna say, I'll, I'm gonna direct some questions over to him, but please feel free other speakers to join in and um, uh, add to the discussion on COVID and uh, black fungus. Um, uh, I'll just start off with a, a quick little a review of this. Being in the West, um, I've seen lately, especially in the last month or so, really gruesome images of COVID-19's wrath in India, uh, particularly in this third wave. Um, at times, my social media uh, timelines are engulfed with images of bodies in flames. Uh, there's this visceral darkness that uh, is kind of commonplace in the uh, and very similar to what was kind of happening in the U.S. Uh, in the New York, New Jersey area during wave one. Uh, Dr. Swyman Singh, could you give us your take on firstly, a quick overview of the COVID situation when you left the US and kind of where you kind of landed when you got to India and if there's parallels and overall what's what's happening there? So yes, thank you so much. I'm. I, I, um, there's so much going on outside that I'm like, my mind is sometimes in two places, I'm sorry, but uh, when, I, yeah, when I left the uh, United States, I guess in er, very early December, uh, the COVID situation was scary, but I guess we were now getting used to it. Uh, we were still kind of scared seeing our patients a bit, but we had kind of gotten over that initial hump. Uh, when I landed in India, 
uh, again, I was wearing my mask and, uh, you know, but that same, you know, uh, feeling we had in America wasn't here yet. I felt like people had, people, people still didn't have the proper knowledge uh, about what COVID is all about. Like either, I guess people were very scared early on and then they kind of moved on thinking, you know, it's nothing. Uh, you know, as you might know, there was a lot of fake testing that happened where people who were positive were told negative and negative to positive. So all this stuff that was in the media, I think kind of law, a lot of the, uh, I don't want to say this, but a lot of the people, especially the uneducated ones, lost their faith uh, in COVID testing, in COVID. So, you know, the masks came off. Uh, and then, you know, if you actually wore a mask, many people said, well, why are you wearing a mask? It's, it almost became one of those situations. Uh, you know, people were like, you know, this, who, you know, is the government behind this? Is the China, you know, is China behind this? Or, or you know, if this thing is, is, is real at all. It was, it was very a messy situation. So when I came here, you know, we came, I came to the, the protest sites, you know, to help people there. Because uh, there were a lot of uh, there were a lot of people, and they were like you know uh, uh, there wasn't much medical care. So I landed here, you know, wore my mask for the first two three weeks, uh, never took it off, literally, uh, you know. And what I saw was there wasn't much COVID on ground, uh, not much. I didn't see any COVID on ground in reality. So things kind of gotten you know really calm. I think in India, and we kind of really you know really didn't think much of COVID. Uh, and I think that was our weakness. I think we took it too lightly. Uh, you know, as far as, as the, I would say the government and the, you know, health, health, uh, healthcare people. But we, on the other hand, I think having seen what we saw in America, kept taking it seriously. We, you know, we, you know, for the past six months, kept, you know, continuing with educating people, especially at the protest about what COVID was all about. Uh, we have handed out over 100,000 masks and 95 masks apart from surgical masks at the protest sites alone, we hand out over, you know, 50,000 sanitizer bottles, you know, especially bigger ones for, for uh, kitchens so people can keep clean. And, you know, kind of did, uh, you, know, um, uh, you know, temperature checks, symptom checks, when we needed to have people isolated, we isolated them within the protest sites. We also did testing uh, at the protest sites. So, you know, we did a lot, uh, I'd say underground, for the past six months that I feel might have been the reason why you don't see uh, the COVID outbreak in the protest, where you saw huge number of COVID cases in Delhi and Haryana got hit really bad. Uh, but what you saw was that COVID really didn't affect the protests. Uh, you never hear, you know, and I'm here on the ground and I'm so amazed uh, that we still don't have it. I mean, there's a lot of reasons for it. Probably one could be herd immunity. Another is people now, you know, some folks, are getting vaccinated and and overall, I think uh, the immunity of the people is strong as well. And I think people are well aware. So I think those kind of things, uh, uh, we thank God and we hope that you know nothing changes and it continues to be what it is. So that's the protest sites and what we did. Uh, as far as in New Delhi, situation was a mess. I mean, uh, the hospitals, there was a mess. Like, you know, there were news reports about hospitals you know, hiring people and putting them on the beds for, you know, thousand rupees. And then when the patient would come, the hospital would say, okay, you know what, we'll give you, uh, you know, give us like this much and then we'll give you a bed. And, you know, so there was a black market for hospital beds. There was a black market for oxygen, oxygen concentrators, every type, type of medication, including paracetamol uh, or Tylenol, as we would say in Canada or in America. Uh, so everything went on black market and it was a really mess, messy, messy situation. Uh, so I, you know, I thought that, that, you know, as a doctor that we had to step up. So we formed a team, uh, a COVID task force, as far as Five Rivers Heart Association, where we bought uh, oxygen concentrators, we bought pulse oximeters, we bought uh, thermometers, steroids, uh, spirometer um, uh, machines. We also bought, you know, paracetamol, all those basically, uh, we packed them up in a bag. And what we would do is we gave up, we, we came up with a hotline number and anytime a patient would call, we would go see the patient, drop off all the medications they would need for the next 20 days. Even if their oxygen was 95, we would still give them steroids and everything. And then what we would do is we would do home follow-ups uh, through telemedicine, uh, you know, and 
when we see that their oxygen would drop below 94, we would say, okay, you know, now you can start taking steroids. And we would basically have everything in their bag so that we don't have to make us, you know, another round uh, to their homes. And I think, you know, it worked really wonderfully. Uh, we, you know, we, whatever oxygen was needed, we would drop off. So, uh, you know, you know, the results we got out of that were amazing. And we were really happy because I felt we really saved lives. And when you save a life, you save a family. So, you know, I was happy to be part of that. And now, uh, from my experience uh, in Delhi, things are really calmed down. I think the government has stepped up their efforts, uh, you know, and really after, I think it was day, day 10, after the initial real bump uh, that you saw that things really got under control. Um, Haryana, same way. Uh, now, the big, big problem in India, the, the biggest problem I see is with the vaccination. The vaccination drive. First, we don't have enough vaccinations. Second, there's not enough effort by the medical community, the government, or you know, overall whoever needs to take control about educating people about, you know, it's 17, 18 months into COVID, we feel like we still haven't educated people on what they're dealing with. So one, we need to tell people better on what COVID is. And second, we need to tell people ins and outs of the vaccine. Uh, I don't know if you saw the news reports of people jumping into the river when people would uh, go and try to vaccinate people in a village. That's because people fear the vaccine. And I think people, that's the, that's the right way to do because if you don't know what's in the injection, what else are you going to do? I think that's the smart way to do it. If any smart person you don't know what kind of injection you're getting, you're just going to say, I'm not going to take the injection. So I think we need to do, uh, as far as medical uh, personnel, doctors, nurses, pharmacists, everybody needs to step up and teach people, media especially, needs to step up and teach the, you know, village to village have conferences where we can go and teach people about all the ins and outs of COVID and all the ins and outs of the vaccine. So that, you know, that's what I see. Wherever I would go and I would try to educate people, when I would start my conversation, nobody would want, you know, or 10 people out of 100 would want the vaccine. When you end the conversation, you'll see all the hands go up because the way you, you basically present your case that yes, you can die, but the chances of death are far less than you suffering from COVID and then having long-term uh, consequences of that. So that's what we've been doing. Uh, but COVID has definitely calmed down in Delhi, parts of Haryana, but we still need to be very, very cautious because uh, sadly, still 18 months in, we're still using lockdown as our primary way to get COVID uh, under control. Wow, that's uh, a great answer. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Puri, Dr. Shimmy Kang, Dr. Garg, did you want to chime in before I ask? I, I just want to first of all thank Dr. Singh for his work. That is wonderful. I've been quite active in India through Global Association of Physicians, and we have been doing a fair amount of education for physicians. And you're absolutely right, the gap which exists from people to people, but even among doctors is just phenomenal. And I think we just need to do more. And the vaccination, we are having a similar challenge in Canada. Uh, we had to really wrap up the awareness of vaccination. So I think your uh, observations are very, very pertinent and hopefully COVID will allow better engagement as we go forward. So thank you for all your work you're doing. Yeah, uh, I mean, I just got to uh, reinforce that. Thank you, Dr. Singh. You know, these this is um, just nothing short of a crisis, you know, having worked in India, seen it, and then think about what could be happening there. All I can say is, uh, you know, I can reinforce your exact story just from being here and talking to our partners in Delhi. Um, our school, Dolphin Pod, shut down over a year ago. Um, and we actually had a COVID outbreak among the staff, um, among the cooks and custodians and the people. Um, and, you know, our partners had to ensure their, um, you know, that they were getting some proper health care. Um, you know, these are already vulnerable people who are now getting, um, who are frightened and scared and um, all kinds of corruption and, and black market issues, like you mentioned. Um, I feel I've been dealing with that, not like you, of course, but just want to verify, um, you know, seeing this and, and we had to get, uh, you know, one of our staff oxygen 
Uh, and it, you know, it was nothing short of a, it's, it's a humanitarian crisis and so grateful for the work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Moving on into this kind of direction again, anybody can take this answer, but uh, just for uh, time uh, constraints uh, because of electricity, I'm kind of covering COVID first before we get into health in case we get cut off here. Um, across the globe, uh, as you mentioned, uh, uh, the human toll for COVID has been uh, drastic. Um, and we're you know, talking about South Asians today and our health um, beyond India. Uh, conditions in places where South Asians live, learn, and work, uh, their relative socioeconomic status, the cumulative effects of racism of brown people, uh, termed weathering, and other factors have directly contributed to this catastrophe. Why has the COVID pandemic been so devastating for South Asians? And what solutions could be found um, to ensure that this doesn't have a repeat? Um, for other crises. Anybody can take that answer or question, sorry. Uh, Jesse, maybe I could just, just start because of uh, interest of uh, CINS. As a matter of fact, that's one of our key points is uh, that why, how can we make society healthier and we are focused on South Asian population. So COVID is a recent thing, but it all started much sooner even like diabetes the chronic disease like diabetes which is four times so the issue is why and i think uh, uh, the answer is not that easy a uh, lot of people say fatalistic what can i do it's in my genes or it's in my uh, genetics i would say right up that that is minimal part of the problem the problem is awareness education engagement of the individuals themselves in chronic care. So I think COVID has clearly shown that we have to be more engaged and very happy to see that globally there is a campaign now uh, that healthcare has to change. Healthcare has to be delivered specific to spe like what we call precision medicine. And that's what integrative thinking is all about. So I think the point you have raised is being recognized much better now. Like uh, COVID, for example, uh, has been affecting uh, people of color uh, and issue is being raised why, why they're being affected more, you know? And uh, it's related to comorbidities, like even simple thing like pre-diabetes. Like in India yesterday, the session we were in, 50% of the people are pre-diabetic. So when they are exposed to uh, COVID, uh, this virus affects them differently than that glucose being absolutely normal. So these are the subtle things which will have to be brought out that we have to start thinking of the individual as a person rather than normal, which applies to everybody. So I would say for discussion, that will be one thing we have to go going forward. We have to turn this crisis into opportunity and provide care specific to individual rather than tire them with the same normal references. Thank you. I, I would agree and, and I just would wanna comment a bit about on the psyche that might be there when we hear these stories of vaccine hesitancy um, by Dr. Singh in India and here and also um, just the, 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 the increased levels of uh, chronic disease in South Asian community, uh, and now we've seen it all again in COVID. Uh, you know, and so as a mental health professional, you know, my, I'm so deeply interested in the human mind and psyche, and I think um, just you know, looking at um, the historical backdrop of how this may have happened, um, in my experience with many South Asians, um, you know, I think we want to really talk a little bit about the effects of colonialism as well, um, and the understanding that there was there was several things that happened in you know the 200 plus years of of, of that in India. One is trauma, um, you know, and intergenerational trauma. And I think of Punjab as, uh, you know, the partition was the largest migration in human history. Uh, my own father, who's 88 years old, um, still has nightmares of 
witnessing his best friend being murdered by a mob in Punjab. Um, and, you know, he's 88 and he lives with PTSD and, and there are millions of people, um, you know, in India who've experienced and, and all over the world um, who have uh, experienced that type of trauma and that is intergenerational and we know similar to Indigenous um, populations and we've seen in other science that this can be passed on um, and elevates our risk of chronic disease, mental health, addiction heart disease, diabetes, cancer, um, you know, and so that's one big impact. And I think that that message can help us understand why we might be seeing all of this um, a bit more um, and have this conversation uh, uh, in a deeper way. And then the second part that happened with colonialism is it disconnects us from our traditional um, indigenous healing practices. Um, you know, Dr. Garg, like you mentioned yoga, um, and, you know, turmeric and food, um, you know, and our, our prayers and med so there's this other aspect, one, it's trauma and intergenerational aspects, and now we have our telomeres more likely to go into that cortisol response, and then second um, is the loss of the ancient traditional indigenous um, uh, and practices, um, many of are so healing, um, you know, like yoga, like food, like meditation, uh, and all of that. So I think that combination we're seeing playing out now, uh, again, in this COVID situation. Thank you. Dr. Puri, did you want to add anything? I completely agree with the comments that have already been shared. And I'm so grateful that both Dr. Garg and Dr. Kang brought up, uh, you know, uh, individualized vulnerabilities, as well as sort of major structural vulnerabilities like intergenerational trauma. I do think I see that in my practice a lot. Um, I've also been wondering about the, um, you know, you mentioned colonialism, Dr. Kang, and I, I've been wondering about whether that's also caused some level of, uh, as Dr. Singh has been alluding to, people kind of not trusting the authorities. If you've lived under the British rule where people have misinformed and taken advantage and there's been so much corruption, I think that you might come from a culture that then stops sort of trusting authorities in the same way and relying really intimately on one another. And in a, in a culture, you know, in a system where we're supposed to be isolating and following authorities, that doesn't really resonate with the way that South Asians, you know, across the world sort of relate to one another. So I've been curious about that as a social phenomenon too, in addition to what Dr. Garg has said about, you know, individual comorbidities, mental health issues, and Dr. Kang has alluded to the, the sorts of mental health conditions that people are already suffering from that might lead them, lend them to be more vulnerable. I've also been wondering about the role of women. I think that we're undergoing a revolution in the South Asian diaspora where we're trying to um, sort of shift the patriarchy that has been present for some time. And I wonder if, you know, women have been under a lot of stress in the pandemic. We know that globally women have been taking a different toll than some of the men have with respect to employment, home duties, et cetera. And so I've been wondering about whether that has been impacting our community just as it has all other communities. So these are some of the other thoughts I might add to the potential reasons why South Asians seem particularly vulnerable to COVID. Great, great thoughts. Dr. Singh, I noticed you um, would like to make a few comments. Hey, uh, so one, one of the things that I would add on is, you know, having worked in India with medical camps and going into rural places, one thing that India has a lot of is, first of all, we have a big class divide, a lot of rich, a lot of poor. Uh, there's hardly a middle class. So we have a lot of doctors. We have a lot of testing. We have a lot of good hospitals. So we have, you know, some things that you might not see in Africa and other places is this big class divide. So we do have the rich. So we have the research, we have the colleges, we have, you know, something on the base. So we are able to test a lot more and we travel a lot more. So we are gonna be bringing COVID in and out. Another thing we have is a lot of the poor, a lot of people who don't have good health care. People don't, you know, real, we have so many patients we come across have blood pressures over 200, diabetes that's uncontrolled, their stomach is like popping out. So what, what we realize is who are the people who died from COVID, right? Who are the people who, die, who suffer most with comorbidities? So what do you have in a lot of South Asian, you know, Asians is comorbidities that nobody has figured out. And no one, no, you know, even the doctor tells them like, hey, buddy, you have hypertension. You need to take these meds. And the patient thinks, we'll take these medications for a week. 
either they can't afford any further medications or they just don't, nobody took the time because there's so many patients, not enough doctors. No, no doctor takes the time with every patient to teach them what is hypertension. We suffer from the same thing in America. It's just a lot less. What is hypertension? How it can kill you? You know, how it affects diabetes. How does diabetes cause retinopathy, nephropathy? What can you do? So people think, oh, I have diabetes. It's fine. I'll take this med potion for a week. And then, you know, everything is going to be fine just because I, I, I feel fine. They don't realize it's small, you know, it's slow killers. They don't kill you right away. They kill you over, you know, a decade or two decades or three decades. So I think there's, this was, this was bound to happen. What we saw with COVID was bound to happen. I think we need to take control. And, you know, when I went to India, my first, like my, when I started going back, uh, I've been in America for 24 years. So I, you know, when I started going back, you know, as a, I thought, you know, I'm going to be, a, you know, I'm a cardiologist now. And now, you know, coming from America, working with stents and working with all these like, you know, valve disease and, you know, maybe one day tower and crazy things. I'm going to go to India and have, you know, these clinics where I'm going to do tower. And then when I came on the ground and started doing camps and what I realized is they don't care about tower here. They don't care about these valve changes and stuff. You need to take care of diabetes and hypertension, the basics. You just do the vital signs on these patients. You already have the diagnosis in 90% of the so I, you know, if we really want to make sure that we pr protect South Asians in the future and do something, one, start doing outreach, teaching people what hypertension, diabetes is, just those basic things, obesity, how to escape that, why is it important to take medication? And I love this comment about, you know, that trust in the hierarchy, trust in the government from the British states. I feel like take that away, 1947, take, go further. 1984, Gujarat riots, other things that have happened over time in India or that happens in, the, in our communities that sometimes, you know, really makes you feel like, can you trust? I feel like we have lost our trust, a little bit of our trust in some of the politicians. So I think when, you know, what we need to do is some, sometimes what we do in America, uh, I'm not sure about Canada, but, you know, not everything should come out of a politician's uh, uh, mouth. When you talk about healthcare, maybe should, you should have a, a very good board of doctors who talk to the people. So it's separate, it separates the government from you know, the medical kind of aspect. And even though they work together, like you know, uh, Dr. Fauci was doing during COVID times in America, like have a separate person that's actually a specialist in that you know, uh, field who talks to the people and tells them like, hey, this is hypertension. And one other thing that you might be seeing in India is that uh, pharmaceutical companies are taking over. So just like how we saw in America some decades back where they would, you know, give doctors money and would give doctors vacations and stuff like that or staples and t-shirts in return that we prescribe a certain medication, that's happening now big time in India. So that, what, and you know, same thing with labs. So you're, you're seeing that the patients are not trusting doctors. So we need to somehow work where doctors are, are held accountable. Patients are able to trust the doctors then maybe, okay, one day they can trust the government, but let's not go there. Let's just talk about doctor-patient relationship. If the patients start trusting their doctors, they will start taking hypertension medication. And next time you have something like COVID, we won't be as affected as we are this time. Hey, thank you very much, Dr. Singh. Uh, last 10 years, Canada Indian Network Society has been active in trying to build some of those bridges so I'm very happy to share with you that the LEADS program we have established is really for that, uh, trying to bring the leadership uh, with the Indian context. Because mention has been made many times that Indians might still be thinking like a colonial mind, and that has to go. And they need to relate to themselves, empower the provider as well as the patient, so they think with that free mind. So I'm very happy to, for the uh, because I think one thing is identifying the problem, but the other is to do something about it. So I think at least in our small way, through CINS, we have established this program now, which is based on uh, modern principles of leadership, leads, but relating it to who you are, what are you, the self-realization. And 10 people have registered for it, so I'm very hopeful that in our small way will make that positive difference. And uh, on the diabetes primary care, we are doing a fair amount of work in Canada uh, through uh, our Surrey 
because we have a large South Asian population. And our principle is empowerment, uh, education, and engagement. And I think that's what we need to do with people directly. We need to go to the people and educate them about what it's all about. And most important is we need to empower them for self-realization, for self-empowerment that you have to take care of your health. And certainly in our community, this is even more important because lifestyle and behavior plays a huge role in these chronic diseases. And again, CINS in our own small way, we have a program, uh, Fraser Health has a program of Sehat, and we are hoping that we could bring this program to Chandigarh through PGI. We have some partners there, go in the villages. So just sharing that in a smaller way, we are bringing this. But the key is we want to institutionalize these uh, uh, efforts. So that's another theme we have is that rather than doing individually, which we do very well, can we institutionalize with the providers, not with the bureaucracy, not with the government, but the, with the providers. So uh, hopefully after uh, this June meeting, uh, we'll move further in this area. Great, thank you. I'm just gonna take a moment just to cover what's happening in the chat here. Uh, Sujata Nilavar uh, noted, incredible work, Dr. Singh. Agree education is the key to vaccine success. Uh, big thank you to you. Bawen Rams wrote, education and making people aware of COVID and its complications, awareness about the chronic diseases and its impact on one's health and its impact on health system, et cetera, needs to be taught to everyone. So uh, message is really resonating with everyone. Uh, Dr. Shimmy, so appreciate your reflection about intergenerational trauma and loss of traditional healing practices. How do we educate and heal ourselves and our patients? And we'll get to that question uh, to you right next. <laughs> and then uh, Cindy also um, has volunteered to stay and has stated, I would be happy to coach people on self-management program in diabetes and chronic pain. So maybe we can link up with Cindy uh, post this conversation to explore that a little further. Um, so I'm going to give Dr. Singh just a slight break here, but feel free to jump into the next portion of the conversation. We'll circle back to you on black fungus and more vaccine stuff, but really I want to right now focus on uh, the external and inter internal intervention on opioid and mental health um, here in British Columbia, but I think globally, I don't have the stats, but I do know British Columbia is quite, uh, quite in detail. Um, opioid crisis has been uh, very problematic for South Asians. Uh, it doesn't seem to, to let, uh, let off. Um, uh, Dr. Puri and Dr. Kang, you both are kind of working in tandem, but in different kind of ways on mental health and opioid. So we really wanted to uh, see your perspectives on, um, on the kind of landscape of opioid uh, crisis and mental health, and then perhaps kind of your insights of solutions into these areas. And um, so whoever would like to go ahead, please, please chime in. Okay, go ahead, Dr. Do you want to go ahead, Dr. Kang, or do you want me to start? You go ahead, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, I, I would appreciate if you want to even tag team because um, you have such extensive experience. I'm definitely learning from this conversation. But um, I think first off, to start this conversation too, I, I sometimes struggle. I, I think when we use the term South Asian, when we refer to the folks in British Columbia, I do want to acknowledge that it's quite a diverse, diverse group of people. And I think when we're looking at, at South Asian folks who are using substances, there are all, there's also quite a lot of diversity in that group. And hence there's different needs. Um, so I, I wanna acknowledge that as I do kind of make comments because sometimes I don't think that it's, I think it's important to say this is not a blanket statement for all folks who use substances who are of South Asian ancestry. And, it, and addiction and mental health are quite complex chronic diseases with a lot of environmental factors that contribute to the way people experience them, the way people can heal from them. So yeah, I'll just put that disclaimer out there first. Um, I think that if I was to think about um, addiction and this, in, especially in this time of COVID, I, I think some of the contributors that I've seen among the patients that I see at the Roshni Clinic are things like family stress, 
uh, financial stress, vulnerable employment situations or rigid employment situations where people are not really getting their human rights necessarily um, respected. For example, I think of people who work in like an industry where their employer will not give them time away for a medical appointment or they feel stressed that they can't leave for taking care of their illness. So these are some environmental factors I see that often um, add to people's addiction illness experiences. And then um, I see people with decreased social support, especially now in the time of COVID, they're not maybe not meeting. Um, and as I mentioned, are the vulnerability of women and the women in the household and how it's challenging. A lot of the folks I see are men um, that are presenting to the clinic. I know there is substance use among women as well, but it, it presents quite differently, I think. And so um, the women are often caught in between supporting um, the men of the household who are using substances. And sometimes that becomes enabling their substance use, and then it creates more trauma in between the family units. So we see just such a complex sort of uh, picture when I see some one person with substance use disorder, it looks like it's affecting several people. So um, I think that all these added stressors, we know that stress kind of can add to the addictive pathway or it, it's, it's interlinked with the addictive pathway. And when you have increased stress, you can activate the addictive pathway and lead to people using more, which then leads to higher tolerance, more withdrawal, more use, and this cycle of using that can lead to worse prognosis of a substance use disorder. So that's what I think we're seeing right now, especially in the, in the time of COVID and as these illnesses are kind of increasing. Um, when you throw in the toxic drug supply issue that's going on um, in British Columbia, I think that's also another huge factor that's creating so much morbidity among the population. So the drug supply here is quite toxic. With COVID, there's become a, a more challenge with, with, with the supply becoming more and more toxic. And that's leading to people overdosing more and having uh, worse health outcomes. Their tolerance is going up even more. It's becoming much more challenging for the treatments that we have to be effective, I think. We're seeing that our opioid agonist therapy that we prescribe is just not effective as it used to be. Um, I started practicing addiction pre-fentanyl crisis. And I just saw very different outcomes with the use of medications like methadone and suboxone, whereas now I see it become much more challenging to manage people's withdrawal with those medications and then help them you know, get into recovery. These medications just aren't able to work the same way. So uh, these are some of the factors that I've been seeing from this external healthcare systems-based perspective sitting for, as a prescriber. Um, and, and there are so many more things that I, that I um, think it, it, it's such a complex picture. Um, I don't know, Dr. Kang, do you have anything to add in terms of what you've been seeing with respect to the opioid use, opioid crisis among folks of South Asian ancestry? Yes, thank you so much. Uh, fully agree with your observations and have definitely seen all of that myself. Uh, you know, I would, I think getting to your comment on stress, I think that's very important. And uh, I think, you know, we're at the place now we can start communicating this a bit more. Uh, I believe education is a core part of this. Um, you know, what does stress do to the brain? Uh, we can start explaining it. And I do that in Punjabi with my, um, in a little bit of Hindi when I, when I, uh, I try my best, but, you know, we can tell um, people that, you know, this is what happens. Um, and you go into this state of freeze, fight, flight. Um, and then I explain freeze is anxiety, freeze is indecisiveness, freeze is feeling stuck and obsessing about something somebody said, your mother-in-law or a friend or something at work, and then explain that's part of the stress response. Fight is irritability, anger, rage. And flight is any form of mental escape, uh, which is alcohol, drugs, opioids, uh, video gaming, Netflix, uh, watching too much Hindi movies even, binge watching and not being there for your family. And though, so when we explain these behaviors, connect it to the stress response, people can suddenly see that they themselves or their loved ones um, you know, are just cycling through that. And sometimes they're irritable and sometimes they're anxious and sometimes they're avoidant, but sometimes, and that's their lower brain, I'll explain it to them. Um, but sometimes they're thinking out of their cortex and they're, they're calm and strategic and problem solving. Uh, so I think education is such a key piece if we can get those kind of messages, take some of the shame away, 
say, this is just how our brains work, recognize stress, the stress of immigration. You know, we know I worked with um, the UBC Department of Cross-Cultural Psychiatry, Dr. Soma Gannison. I have to put a shout out to his work um, and I've worked with him. You know, people in the first five years of immigration, we see higher rates of psychosis, higher rates of depression, higher rates of addiction, substance use because of that stress. So let them know they're not alone. Um, this is the science of what can happen. Um, and then getting back to that intergenerational trauma, connecting it to um, you know, how their experiences. So, you know, I just educated my 88 year old father on this and he was very kind. And I, I put it in a big article that was uh, in Drishti magazine recently. Um, Drishti covered the topic of mental health. They asked me to speak on it. Um, and I gave my, my father's story. Um, and I said, you know, um, we have to talk about the intergenerational trauma coming out of India. Um, and in particular, we have the documentation. We know what happened during partition. We know um, what those individuals saw. That came down a whole generation um, and multiple generations. So um, I think that there's, there's a lot of, I, I think there's new conversation that can add to it. Um, and, and I think that that can be healing and proactive. The other thing I have to say, and um, I'm very grateful for the role of family doctors in primary care and, and particularly our South Asian doctors. Uh, however, though, I do have to say that I have also been disappointed um, having worked in uh, primary care um, clinics in, many years ago when I was uh, a, a, an intern, I did, um, I did some locomy. I saw the prescription of opioids too readily. I saw um, way too much overprescribing, um, and that's not just in our South Asian community. That's in all medical communities. I worked in the U.S. I was in Boston. I studied at Harvard when OxyContin came out. Um, so I think as physicians, as doctors, um, in particular the South Asian stuff, we have to hold them also accountable to how they are educating the population. I feel, uh, I feel there's been iatrogenic um, and, and um, a bit uh, some part of this opioid in particular epidemic, and we know now, especially coming out of the US and OxyContin, has been driven by prescribers um, and their lack of education and, and, and um, proper treatment. I feel that's happening here in the South Asian community. And I think that we also, we need to call that out and recognize that as well um, and, and help people be advocates for their health when they go to a family doctor um, or they go to a clinic and before they get that prescription um, or a quick fix, um, you know, to say that, look, you wanna actually make sure uh, what are the other options um, to something that might be a benzo or might be uh, an opioid? Uh, so I think that education to the public, but also um, education and partnership with primary care and prescribers uh, is absolutely key. One idea. I would agree. And I just wanted to pick up on one of the threads Dr. Kang said as well to highlight one of the populations that we do see quite a lot in the Roshni Clinic are international students. And a lot of them are coming with migratory stress. They're coming with significant family stress. They're living in homes that where, you know, they're quite vulnerable. Either they're living with other students and there's, you know, financial stress. They're afraid to reach out to their family members because there's a significant amount of shame around having come for schooling and then fallen into a substance use disorder. Um, you know, a lot of the people who are selling drugs prey upon international students and kind of get them onto substances. You know, oh, it'll help with this exam or this. So we're just seeing a lot, a lot of vulnerability when we talk about folks who are kind of in that early immigration progress uh, process, sorry, and especially those who are young, it kind of like falls directly into it. Dr. Kang might, maybe has expertise in, but um, we're also seeing those folks actually needing a lot more outreach. And there are a lot of amazing community organizations doing that, like engaged um, communities, I'm sorry, I can't remember their name, I think that's their name, um, Such BC, Team Suda, um, South Asian Mental Health, you know, there's just a variety of organizations trying to really reach out to some of these vulnerable folks, because they don't want to come in for care, because they're afraid of their immigration status getting affected by seeing a physician. So these are some other things that I just wanted to add to color in the picture. I mean, there's so much to, more to color in, but I really wanted to pick up that thread Dr. Kang said in terms of migratory stress, I think is quite a significant contributor right now. Also, some of the folks 
in that age category that we see, they come having already used substances in Punjab because we know that there is substance use issues quite prevalently there. Um, they're using different opioids in, in Punjab, but when they come over and they get hooked onto the fentanyl, then you have a magnification of that particular issue. And we see a lot of concurrence as well in the population that presents to Roshni. I don't exactly have the numbers, but I can assure it must be at least 30% of folks who come with concurrent opioid and alcohol use disorders that are diagnosable. So it's not just, oh, I sometimes use alcohol, I sometimes use opioids. We're talking diagnosed use disorders, which you know lends a severity. And then we're also limited in the way we can treat those conditions sometimes because the treatments we use for opioid use disorder can sometimes interact or be problematic when taken in conjunction with alcohol. So, and vice versa, a treatment that we use for alcohol use disorder called naltrexone, um, which is the first line medication option that we can offer people is contraindicated, which means people who use opioids cannot take that. So then we get into a lot of greater need for psychosocial interventions which requires that education, that time, that behavior change, and, and that, that recognition of stress. So I'm sorry to be rambling. I just kind of, again, there are, there's such a, there's so many details to this picture um, that, that uh, are important and interesting that I think are worth highlighting and are quite relevant to this particular population. I don't see this in my non-South Asian practice as much or really ever. I've never had an immigration issue in my other practice, um, whereas I see it repeatedly at Roshni. Yes, I, I would just say thank you for that. And I think, you know, the students um, that you mentioned, and again, getting back to, you know, the awareness and in, in some of the new science is, you know, letting them know that their brain isn't fully formulated, right? Until 24, 25, that is neuro human neuroplasticity. And so that it's a high risk time period. Um, and, and having, uh, programming that understands that. Um, and it was so, I'll just give the example at Children's Hospital, it was so vital uh, when, you know, when I set up the program there that it went to 24 because we didn't want 18 year old, 19 year old, um, you know, children, in my opinion, girls were going to the downtown east side and St. Paul's Hospital and, um, you know, and now they're vulnerable to uh, all kinds of issues. So having that youth specific focus as well um, and that concurrent focus with mental health screening, uh, because we know there's at least 70 to 78% comorbidity of all addictions. Uh, and I'm really concerned about technology addiction. I don't think um, this is discussed enough. We need to screen for it. Uh, you know, I see it, um, it is, it, you know, there, the dopamine aspect is very clear. We don't get addicted to a substance. We get addicted to the dopamine feedback loop in our brains and that can come from a substance but it can also come from gambling it can come from um, pornography it can come from video gaming um, it can even come from online shopping uh, and I've seen people's lives devastated from um, you know from the use from their phones really it's you know starting here as well so I think that's a whole new layer uh, and I'm seeing in the chat parental control uh, and I think that you know, that's another issue in our community where the generation gap is is bigger when um, you're, let's say, an immigrant person, English is your second language, you're trying to navigate the school system, let's say here in Canada um, or anywhere, and then your children are born here and they, they know how to use tech and Zoom calls and now you lose authority as a parent. Um, they see you as outdated, they see you out of touch, um, and it's very hard to set limits on something like that. Uh, and then henceforth, then we see um, these behaviors uh, show up, whether it's technology use or drugs and alcohol. So th there's that complexity in the family dynamics as well. Uh, Jesse, if I could just uh, bring out uh, Canada Indian Network Society through our efforts, fully recognize and agree with what being said. And we are looking for solutions going forward. So I think what emerges is that whatever we do has to be culturally effective and efficient. The times of applying general population rules just don't fit. And I think that's a very key message we have to take forward. And the issue of education and empowerment and engagement. And I would like to just re-emphasize the empowerment. So education is not top down, 
but bottom up. We need to engage with the people so they understand what we're talking about. And I think this is where the role of uh, ancient wisdom comes in. We need to empower people with which they're aware of and they feel comfortable. And we have talked a lot about brain today, but in terms of healing, there is more than just body and brain. There is the issue of mind and intellect. And I think we need to start thinking in those terms as we go forward. And Jesse, I'm very pleased and I want to share with our few people who have joined that at our meeting in 18, 19, 20, that's the conversation we're going to have. We are having Dr. Nagendra from S. Vyasa joining us, who is doing a fabulous job of integrative empowerment, diabetes, chronic diseases. How do you empower people so they take better care of themselves based on what Vedic philosophy talks about is uh, uh, prana, mana, and buddhi. And I think we need to start thinking in those terms to combine the East and West, to combine the best of the East and best of the West, uh, at least for South Asian population and different cultures will have different engagement. And I think one of the key messages that in medicine, we need to evolve to be precision medicine, not only biochemistry precision, but behavior precision. Great summary. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I think Dr. Singh uh, has been dropped off uh, the Zoom. They are having major issues. He just WhatsApp me. He's unable to join us back or join back into the call. So real uh, huge thank you to him. Uh, in the comments here, Bawin uh, Ram had uh, noted that the idea presented by Dr. Singh regarding without uh, regarding having a separate organization of doctors only, um, I think he's implying that that's a great idea. It kind of got cut off. Uh, going back to other chat uh, kind of comments, Cindy again, big shout out to her for saying I'm grateful to be on this call today. Finally, a group who can communicate, speak the same language of mental health and agree with empowerment, uh, educate and engage. Uh, Nidhi Gupta noted substance abuse among youth is also because they find it as a way of acceptance in a group. Parents need to keep an eye out on the pointers indicating onset of such situations. They may be definitely, they may, this may definitely support the practitioners during the course of treatment. Um, more than the stress of immigration, we observe other behaviors in those young students as commoners every day around us. This creates a sense of insecurity to us, of parents of kids who are still young and have been in this country for a while. Uh, the beauty of communication is to take each individual holistically, includes parents and family. Um, I think uh, loving all the comments, we only have a few minutes left, um, but I, I really want to talk about uh, and Dr. Garg had uh, kind of mentioned it, you both Dr. King and uh, Dr. Puri have noted about the self-empowerment uh, of the patient um, through the lens of, of mental health. Um, do you have ideas, solutions to kind of move this concept forward? What are you doing in your, in your own practices? Um, if you could share a little bit and elaborate on, on that kind of conversation. I'm happy to jump in first. I, I think I, I'm very passionate and very interested um, in early uh, intervention and prevention strategies. Uh, I So what made me leave Children's Hospital, uh, I'm still a professor at UBC, but is to um, fully work with the school system. Um, so I have put a um, major of my own efforts and time in working with the school system to improve what's called social emotional learning, uh, teaching coping skills, teaching self-empowerment skills, teaching mindfulness, breathing techniques, gratitude practice. Um, you know, we're doing all kinds of stuff, early stress management, uh, social skills, uh, you know, teaching young people how to uh, say no, healthy assertiveness. Um, you know, we use the dolphin metaphor and, and, and we teach kids how to be firm but flexible. So, you know, if they don't want to play a video game, they say no, but maybe we can play outside. Simple, simple things that are proven strategic when we introduce them at a younger age, 
And then now um, through that school system, we can reach parents um, because that is a system that exists. Uh, it exists in India and it exists in Canada. Um, so if we can get more um, social, emotional, mental health literacy and empowerment, social skills in our school systems, um, now we're reaching a whole generation um, and we, and um, you know, I said, I don't want a six month waiting list um, and then tell after that, start teaching this then when the brain has already been um, firing the stress response and patterns and behaviors are there. Uh, let's start early. That's where all the science and evidence is. Uh, so, so that is an area that I think um, if we can go um, and reach into the Canadian and Indian curriculum, and the Indian curriculum now, I reviewed it, um, you know, the new, the, the Indian government released a new um, framework for uh, education, which does include, um, you know, emotional regulation, emotional skills, and social skills. So there's a huge opportunity there now to cross into the school system and um, get young people and their parents and families um, on board. So, so I feel that's a, a major area of uh, work for me personally, and, and I hope uh, that uh, I'll have more partners in that area. Great. Great, thank you so much. That's fascinating and I completely agree. And I think from my perspective where I see folks who may be further along in life um, and we don't necessarily have the opportunity to uh, intervene in those preventative stages and we have folks who are further along in the disease process. I agree with Dr. Garg in this idea of um, bringing in, uh, in you know, healing modalities that are indigenous to our South Asian background, as well as other um, you know, empowerment strategies. I'm just really curious about how they can be integrated into the healthcare system in an effective way. I find that you know, we're quite separate right now. The healthcare system has a way of functioning, a way of talking that's quite um, different sometimes than those, uh, those other modalities. And I would love to see more trial programs and much more research. I really think that there's not enough evidence in this area. A lot of us are saying these things. We need culturally resonant care. Um, I've talked a lot about peer support and family therapy significantly in, in, you know, when I, in the folks that I see in practice. Um, and I think you know, looking at masculinity, engaging the men in their own care, maybe doing you know, um, sports or doing other kinds of activities that might resonate, that bring people together, bring them into themselves make them feel confident and you know, get meaning in their life. These are interventions that I think we all viscerally know will have some impact, but there's not enough evidence to really bring it into the dominant healthcare system. And that's how health authorities work, that's how systems tend to work. So I think we need to study these things in some way as well and show that they work and, and really do see, see what does work and what doesn't, especially for this population where maybe things have moved along. There are more responsibilities. There are different stressors of the adult life um, and you have a disease process that's further along. So these are just some of the interventions that I've been wondering about. I'll just repeat them again, peer support, family therapy, um, culturally resonant care, addressing masculinity, things like this, and how to really integrate them into healthcare and quick clinical tools. Excellent observations. Um, I'm going to uh, move over to Dr. Garg, but I just want to quickly again uh, mention uh, these chat items. In many categories of empowerment, couples empowerment, women's empowerment, gender empowerment, to name a few, teaching in the schools, assertive skills, sexuality, and self-care. Again, another shout out to Cindy. Uh, Suroj Kumar, thanks everyone for your contribution. We recognize community requires more education. I wonder if anyone had any recommendation for the same. I feel government is not to be, not to be blamed for as you see information conversation on TV, radio all the time, but you can't make uh, deaf people hear you. And Bhushan Kapoor uh, wrote, it is very important to make the treatment programs be culturally sensitive. I agree with Dr. King that we need to be speaking lay language. I think this is a beautiful segue now, Dr. Garg. You know, you're, you've created this platform and uh, these conferences, um, and we have these great panelists who are experts in their fields. Um, how are you gonna um, take all these uh, kind of comments and recommendations and operationalize them? Gonna leave it to you now. Thank you very much. I think as you say, our time is coming to an end. So I want to take this opportunity, Jesse, to thank two Jesse's again to make it possible, a small team, 
I think it shows what can be done, you know, what we have done and what can be done. Uh, slowly, small steps. So as far as Canada Indian Network Society is concerned, what we do is we bring people together, get ideas, make some recommendation, and then try to help to see if they could be turned into projects. And as I shared before, we had three projects which have come out of our previous conferences four really if you count human resource so south asian health institute and i'm hoping that institute now will carry on providing culturally sensitive culturally and that words i like to use culturally efficient and effective care uh, to at least the population fraser health serve and that could be a role model but i would say next uh, frontier really is research as dr puri said there is a real dearth of solid work in interventions and how interventions work. The traditional interventions, that's one thing, which are mostly based on physical uh, body part, uh, understanding of body and a little bit of brain. But I think we need to go deeper and then we need to understand culturally effective and efficient and sensitive interventions for this population and hoping that after our June meeting, there will be some recommendations. CIHR is making an effort, uh, trying to bring some research activity, and we've been exploring some collaborations in that area, Jesse. So hopefully there will be some positive outcomes of those. It's a, it's a long road, uh, but it's the awareness. And I think the one area where we could play a major role, and there are several colleagues from journal practice on this session that the journal practitioners working with their divisions and with the organizations can incorporate some of these interventions in some capacity so that patients are more engaged. Now that's a mouthful of words and I'm fully aware of the challenges in that relationship, but I think that's one area where I think there is a real opportunity. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, just going to uh, review these last couple of comments and then make some closing remarks and then we can all um, uh, get on with our days. Uh, as Sujata Nilavar wrote, as a family doctor in Surrey, North Delta, I do engage my pain patients with these ideas and strategies. However, our system does not value these conversations. I do know they help and these conversations are powerful. If anything, creating awareness starts the conversation. Excellent point. Minnie Downey, thank you everyone for the great conversation. And Jesse Pandal, uh, I've started a South Asian project in the Ministry of Social Development and Poverty Reduction, which led to the creation of such. My team works with street entrenched clients and the feedback we get is that clients don't know where to go and who to tell their story to and then they get connected no one else no one understands them we need to remove these bar barriers shimmy had to leave but i just wanted to say it's been an honor to moderate today's conversation i'd like to thank our guest speakers today for the powerful work they're doing and for taking time to provide their insights to the discussion thank you to everyone attending today please do sign up for the full conference on the website the c the cins uh, org. And lastly, it takes a village to do anything. And we're so thankful to our conference sponsors, our board, team members, and particularly Dr. G for this excellent space to have these conversations. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. And uh, thanks for joining today. Have a call. Back up.